Now, animated movies have been consistently super popular for a good number of years now, with studios like Disney, Pixar and DreamWorks releasing various fun, light-hearted movies each year that families and children can watch and enjoy. Such classics as Old Man Balloon House, The Cooking Rat, Big Green Man, Big Blue Man and The Cold Film, each featuring unique, well-written concepts and original characters with teams of animators working hundreds of hours to create beautifully detailed animation styles, with a large number of these animated movies going on to win Academy Awards, all made possible by the sheer amount of effort that goes into them. All round, they're undeniably works of art in movie form. But we all have those animated movies you watched as a kid that you stick firmly in a strange back corner of your brain, holding them in a different state of nostalgia over all the other huge blockbuster titles. And for me, that movie was hoodwinked. Released in 2005, being directed by Corey Edwards, Hoodwinked is a play on the classic Little Red Riding Hood story. But wait, there's more. It's in the format of a whodunit detective mystery movie. Kinda like Little Red Riding Hood meets Scooby-Doo. Or that funny space game. Stop posting about Among Us! Now, the animation quality does stick out over everything when you first look at Hoodwinked. It has that weird early computer animation Toy Story 1 look, like someone's turned the movie's graphic setting down to low. But there is a reason for this. Studio Blue Yonder Films completely independently funded the movie themselves, meaning the movie's budget was only around $8 million, which for an animated movie at the time really was not a lot of money. And to save costs, the movie was animated in the Philippines, with Blue Yonder Studios building a team of animators that had no real animation experience, which explains why it looks like a PS1 game. But let's be real, kids will watch anything you put in front of them. I mean, five seconds on the YouTube Kids app will tell you that. Fantastic! You have friggin' dinosaur feet! Are you- are you here, Jesse? Whoa, whoa, oh, crap! Whoa. How's it going? What, what, what the hell are you? <laughs> But despite the low budget and scuffed animation, the movie's plot is great, and weirdly, it has a pretty star-studded cast, with Anne Hathaway as the lead. And as for the movie's box office performance, with the initial budget of $8 million, to this day, it's managed to pull in $110 million, which for an independently funded movie animated in the Philippines, isn't too bad. So the movie opens with the main character, Red, visiting her granny. She drops the classic fairy tale lines we all know too well. What big hands you have, and what big ears you have. But of course, it isn't her granny. It's actually Joe from Family Guy. Right. Now let me get this out of the way right here. The wolf is voiced by Patrick Warburton. Are we just gonna sit around here and talk about how big I'm getting? Who of course voiced such popular characters as Kronk, Joe Swanson, and the funny Pooh Waterman from B Movie. Water. Anyway, Red and the Wolf get into a slight altercation and we discover that real Granny was tied up in the closet this whole time. But before all three of them can get into a fight, an axe-wielding maniac smashes through the window. And the title screen rolls. Eventually, we see that Granny's house is now the scene of a crime. And over here, Chief Grizzly, who is voiced by Exhibit, by the way, take questions about a supposed goodie bandit that is on the loose. Are the suspects inside connected with the goodie bandit? Yeah, uh, no, no, don't print that, Maxine. Inside the house, it seems that every suspect of the crime has been rallied up. Red, Granny, the wolf, and of course, the crazed axe man. We then introduce a detective and frog in a suit, Nicky Flippers, who's turned up in hopes to solve the case. Now, I've seen a couple people mention how it's weird for an animal character to have a dog as a pet, but honestly, it's not that strange. I mean, Mickey had Pluto, and let's be real, we're watching a movie where the chief of police is a grizzly bear in a police uniform. I think we can overlook a frog with a pet. Okay, why the fuck is he taking notes? Anyway, Nicky and Red quickly become acquainted. Why they call you flippers. Uh, no reason. And he sits her down for a police interview so we can hear Red's account on how the crime took place. We learn that her day started like any other, riding her bike to make deliveries for her granny's delivery shop. Oh yeah, the movie is also a musical and boy does the music slap. <laughs> After the impromptu sing-along, Red runs into resident bunny rabbit Boingo, voiced by Andy Dick. 
She then asks him what he's doing around the woods, and we learn that Boingo's boss, the Muffin Man, had all of his recipes stolen earlier that day, leaving Boingo out of a job. Aren't you helping the Muffin Man today? Oh, he closed up shop. Someone took all his recipes last night. Now I'm out of a job. So instead, he's running the cable cars up the mountain. Red gives him a carrot cupcake to cheer him up. Wow, this is so good. Woo, 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 woo. And he hops off on his merry way. In a quick change of mood, Red notices that all the animals around the woods are suddenly closing their businesses and packing up their bags. Through Red's narration, we learn that this is all at the hands of the dastardly goodie bandit, stealing everyone's recipes. With the goodie bandit on the loose, recipes were becoming an endangered species. And I guess they live in a land where remembering things doesn't exist. So does everyone in the woods just have one singular copy of their recipe book, like the secret formula from Spongebob? Like, surely if the recipes were this sacred, you would have made backups, or copies of them, just in case something like this were to happen. Or... I could shut the fuck up and stop applying clever man logic to funny kids movie now. <laughs> Concerned, Red decides to call Granny to check up on how she's doing and asks her if she knows what to do. I don't know what to do. Red suggests that maybe she should bring their recipe book all the way up the mountain to Granny's house to keep it safe. But to her dismay, Granny says no, because she thinks it would be way too dangerous. Maybe I should bring you the recipe book. Just for safekeeping. A trip up the mountain is too dangerous for a little girl. I'm not so little anymore. Walk away my tooly, what do you do? After the phone call, Red vents her frustration to a woodpecker that sounds like a five-year-old. I'm just a kid. I'm just a woodpecker. About how Granny doesn't trust her and that she's a detriment to society. Then drops her magazine off the tree and causes a fatal car accident, killing an innocent mallard duck. But before the two of them even have time to react, they're interrupted by a sudden strange noise. <sighs> They race down the tree to discover that Granny's shop window has been smashed and Red finds a rock labelled You're Next. You're Next? What, what does it mean, You're Next? This threat seems to be the final straw for Red. Despite what Granny said on the phone, Red unlocks the safe and sneakily stashes the recipe book under some cakes in her basket and starts to make her way up the mountain. Yeah, fuck you, Granny. And then you set out on a dangerous journey up the mountain. Unknown. She hops on a cable car where Boingo asks Red where she's heading, and she shares her plans to protect Granny's recipes by taking them up the mountain. But she's soon cut short when the cable car door flies open, causing her to fall deep into the woods. <gasps> She gets her photo taken via squirrel mouth camera and comes across a scary large footprint in the dirt. Is it Bigfoot? Bigfoot confirmed? No, it's just Patrick Warburton again. I'm Patrick Warburton. Wolf asks Red what she's doing this deep in the woods and demands to see what's in her basket. She of course says no and he roars at her to scare her off, I guess. Let me have a look. I'd rather you didn't. <laughs> Well, it just results in her running away. Red sprints through the trees, but he manages to instantly catch up with her somehow and then gets pepper sprayed. <laughs> Red manages to make it out of the woods where her winged friends come to the rescue, allowing her hood to float through the trees, easily baiting Wolf off the edge of a cliff into the river. We do a little trolling. It's called We Do a Little Trolling. Back in the police interview, Red is pretty adamant that Wolf is the goodie bandit, and so is Grizzly. We got our bandit. But Nikki mentions they can't be too quick to point fingers. Fingers. Flippers. Feet. Red continues on with her alibi and explains that halfway up the mountain, she stopped off at a mining shack, where she runs into this bizarre goat character that rocks back and forth on his own horns. And his USP is that he can only speak in song, all thanks to a spell that a witch put on him years ago. And now I gotta sing everything I say. Everything? That's right. You just talked! Just now! Did I? Did I, 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 did I do? Bruh. Red uses the goat's phone to check up on Granny a second time, but this time she seems a little distressed. I need to put down fresh doilies. Ah! Granny! Banzai! Worried by the phone call, Red asks the strange goat if he knows any shortcuts up the mountain, where of course he breaks into song again. And that's why this hero mountain goes prepared. During the chart-topping hit, Red realises that there's a series of railway networks up the mountain, and after a long list of the goat's horn varieties, he pulls a lever, dropping the two of them down into a minecart that snakes up the mountain. An avalanche appears out of nowhere, and they fly off a broken rail into the sky, where Red sees a vision of Granny in the clouds, and then she utters a knockoff Star Wars reference. Granny? Use the hood, Red! Use it's so awesome! The hood. 
That's so awesome. Red takes her advice regardless and uses the hood as a parachute. And we learned that it was here on the timeline that Red visited Granny that we saw at the start of the movie. First, I was attacked by that crazy wolf. Hi -ya! Then my Granny jumped out of the closet. <laughs> but she was tied up. <laughs> Only he was screaming. Arrgh. Like a maniac. Huh? Calm down! You calm the fuck down! That wolf was gonna eat us all. After retelling her version of events on how it all went down, it's time to hear Wolf's side of the story. It's quickly revealed that Wolf is none other than a reporter hosting column in the local newspaper. Hey, uh, wait a minute, Flippers. You saying this guy's a cop? And worse, he's a reporter. A what? And I've got the real story. Wolf claims he was in fact investigating the Goody Bandit case himself, trying to find leads on who it might be, interviewing suspects all around the woods, from hedgehogs playing basketball to this weird furry bloke. I just want to say that I am a furry. He soon catches a glimpse of Red riding her bike like she was doing earlier on in the movie with the musical number, and decides that she looks suspicious enough to investigate. Who does she move the goodies for? Where do they come from? Where are they going? You likely are the sus. Imposter. We're also then introduced to Wolf's squirrel companion, Twitchy, who may just be the most fucking annoying animated character of all time. He went past the porcupines and the redbird's tree and the guy with the long beard and now she's up the creek and she sings everywhere she- He's basically a knockoff hammy from over the hedge if you had one gigabyte of RAM to render him. And apparently he's voiced by director Corey Edwards, who I imagine hopped in the recording booth and then they just went wild on his voice in audacity. Wolf and Twitchy disguised themselves as livestock and bribed this mafia boss sheep to get info on Red. The girl in the hood. You get around the mountain, who does she work for? How should I know? I ain't that curious. It's the family business. Ain't you ever heard of Granny Puckett? Wolf learns about her mission to take Granny's recipe book up the mountain via cable car, and with this info, the two of them set off to track her down. Wolf makes use of a device that allows him to listen to Red and Bongo's conversation on the cable car, but of course, Red falls out of it. Twitchy swallows the camera and falls right next to her, explaining the weird moment from earlier. And it turns out that Wolf's roar wasn't him trying to be menacing, he just got his tail stuck in Twitchy's camera. Well, I'm a curious guy. Let me have a look. I'd rather you didn't. <laughs> but how did Wolf catch up with Red so fast earlier on? Well, he hailed a taxi, of course. Beep, beep, motherfucker! He gets pepper sprayed, <laughs> beaten up, Nikki teases him for getting battered by a little girl. You really took a beating from a little girl. Hey. And we find out that Red was a regional karate champion. After chasing Red down, Wolf of course falls for the bait that Red set up earlier. Okay, not cool. Go get you and your little granny too. Oh, that's fishy. Is this a fisherman fishing for fish in a society where animals can talk? Is he kidnapping them? In fact, with everyone in the woods liking cakes and stuff, one of the main ingredients in these things is milk that comes from a cow. I mean, we've already seen that livestock are basically people in the movie, so with the milk, is everyone just consuming... Oh no. After drying off, him and Twitchy run into Boingo, who somehow magically made it off an ongoing cable car and made it back down to land in just a couple of minutes. But anyway, he overhears their plan to go up the mountain and mentions that he knows a shortcut. You know how to get there? Oh yeah! Yeah, in fact, I know a shortcut. I'll be honest, with the amount of people heading up the mountain at this point, it's gonna end up looking like Mount Chiliad on a full GTA Online lobby. Well, it turns out that said shortcut was through an underground cave system that is clearly pretty dangerous. <laughs> But they eventually find a way out in the form of a heavenly lit ladder. They climb up, narrowly dodge a passing minecart, and this gives Wolf an idea. Before we know it, the two of them are hurtling up the mountain. Twitchy makes a throwaway comment about hearing an avalanche. What's that? What? Sounds like an avalanche. Well, Twitchy, that's natural. It's just old man mountain showing us who's boss. And the two of them head into a dark cave. Thankfully, Twitchy lights up a candle, soon realising that it's actually... Being a meat cave. Oh, must be Italian. Panicking, they drop the stick of dynamite, in turn, lighting up an entire stack of the stuff. So Wolf quickly tosses that shit out of the car, and I'm sure you can guess where this is going. They blow up the entire railway system, and then Red's cart flies into the air behind them. Did you hear something? Mm? 
In fact, just a couple of minutes ago, you actually see Red and the goat whiz past behind them. Wowzer, what a nice touch. The two of them finally make it to Granny's abode. Wolf gets jump scared, and he disguises himself in some limited edition Granny Pocket merchandise. They hear Red coming, Wolf shoves Twitchy in the closet with a tied up Granny, and he gets ready for his big moment. But before we can hear the rest of the story, Grizzly makes an observation. You said the old lady was already tied up? How did that happen? But Wolf claims he honestly had no idea why Granny was already tied up in the closet. I just write the news, Chief. I don't make it. And Nikki thinks it's finally time to speak to the unexplained link in all of this. The axe maniac himself. You're a big fella, aren't you? Shop at the big and tall store, eh? This is a big and tall mistake. Now, he may just be the most disturbing character in the entire movie. I guess they spent all their budget before they made this guy. His eyes are permanently bolted open, his arms are smooth, hairless blobs, and his beard looks like an extension of his face. But before we find out how the Axe Maniac fits into the crime, we have a word from our sponsor. Um, hey, I have problem. Okay, what is problem? Um, I have hair. Well, yes, I also have hair. No, I mean I have too much hair. Well, just use rock. Rock work great to cut hair. No, I mean I have hair down there. Oh, well, I guess you could all... Did I hear hair troubles? Um... Who are you? I don't have much time, but I'm from the future, and I heard you have problems with hair. Yes, yes, hair down, down there. Yes, yes, I know. Well, don't worry, men. I'm here to help. I have a package. A package? Yes, my hairy friend. A package from Manscaped. Manscaped? Correct. And believe it or not, Manscaped is the only men's brand dedicated to below-the-waist grooming and hygiene. Wow. Wow, indeed. The Perfect Package 3.0 from Manscaped. Perfect Package. And it actually comes with a brand new Lawnmower 3.0 body trimmer. The only body trimmer on the market to feature skin safe technology. It keeps my skin safe. Oh, you bet it does. It works to reduce accidental nicks and cuts from grooming because trust me, you don't want to cut your balls. I've done that several times. But it won't happen with these babies. It features a powerful 7,000 RPM motor. Motor? What is... Motor. Oh yeah, uh, my bad. You'll invent those in a couple million years or so. But the device is also waterproof, so I can use it in the rain? Correct, or when you're having a shower. It's cordless on use, so it has a rapid charging dock that you can conveniently plug in via USB. The kit also comes with the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. Ooh, toned balls. Toned balls indeed. Plus a replenishment of your favourite product and a replacement blade for your trimmer every three months via mail when you sign up for Manscaped's Peak Hygiene Plan. Yes, I sign up now! Plus, for a limited time, you get two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. Wow, I like. And just for you, get 20% off, free international shipping and two free gifts when you use promo code Giuseppe at checkout on manscaped.com. Who is Giuseppe? Um, don't worry about him. Remember, men, your balls and body will thank you. So when the creepy axe man sits down, we learn two things. One, he sounds like a knockoff Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, I am working to make good my callback. And two, he's an actor who recently had an audition for a commercial advertising Paul's Bunyan Cream. Paul's Bunyan Cream has the soothing formula to make the bunions head for the hills. And it turns out that said audition didn't quite go to plan, you lizardy bastard gex looking motherfucker. Yeah, so listen, we'll look at your tape and we'll give you a call, okay? Thanks for coming in, have a nice life. Depressed and down on his luck, we see him wander out to his truck, which we also saw at the start of the movie, to start his day job of selling schnitzels. Which results in one of the creepiest musical numbers I have ever seen. But the happy jolly sing song is soon cut short when we see that the schnitzel van has been vandalised. What the schnitzel? But it's not all bad news because he receives a phone call from the lizard director man who reveals that they want him for a second audition to play the part of the woodsman in the commercial. Come back in? It's a callback. I had always heard about callbacks. 
But I had never gotten one. A call back? So to get into character, he commits mass tree culling and increases the rate of global warming twofold. <laughs> After destroying the entire forest, he comes across a behemoth of a tree and he goes to work, chopping at it all through the night until it literally defies physics. Welcome to physics. He's quickly distracted by a distant scream, and as we all saw coming, he's chased down the hill by the tree, causing him to smash through the window. So, you didn't jump through the window, you were pushed? Yes. See, it all makes sense now, except it doesn't because we still don't know why Granny was tied up. So, it's time to hear from the old lady herself. Then it all points to Granny. Now, before Granny can even sit down, Red is pretty quick to point out that she'll have nothing to do with the crime because she's just an innocent old lady. My Granny doesn't keep secrets. And even if she did, she'd tell me about it. <sighs> we tell each other everything. But it seems that this isn't the case. This old lady is leading a double life. You liar! Chief! The police discover that the closet Granny was trapped in is full to the brim with sports trophies and Granny has a tattoo on the back of her neck. Safe to say that this pensioner is quite the adrenaline junkie. In an intense montage, we see the extreme sports that Granny has been partaking in over the past couple of months and learn that right after her phone call with Red, she headed off to her next big venture, the Extreme Dream Snow Competition. And there is no way that this many models on screen didn't crash the animation software. Granny meets up with her team and they inform her of their new race rivals from Europe. And I will give 10 British pounds to anyone that can tell me what animal this is. I mean, what is this? Some sort of Rastafarian fox rat thing. What the fuck is that? What's that? What's that thing? The two teams ready up at the start line and I take it back. This motherfucker is the worst looking character in the movie. Like any generic European villains, things go south pretty quickly, with Granny's skis being turned into a makeshift snowboard. But it seems this is no issue for her as she absolutely destroys them via the medium of snowballs with absolutely no effort at all. Win. And it was sometime during all of this chaos that Granny gets the second phone call from Red, explaining the distress from earlier. Granny gets in a tussle with the boss and finds herself hanging off the edge of a cliff at the hands of the creepy European man. And if the crazed axe man sounded like a knockoff Arnold, this guy definitely looks like one. You tell me this instant! All right. We were hired by the bandit! Fuck it, that's two out of two. Dolph isn't voiced by Ty Edwards. He's now voiced by Arnold. Bandit! He endgames Granny off the edge of the cliff and Granny dies. Granny is finished. No, of course she doesn't. She's prepared. She attaches a bungee cord as she's falling and manages to make it back up to the hill. Ah, finally, some bliss. Until she throws down two fucking grenades and starts an avalanche for absolutely no reason at all. It's coming in, I do not feel prepared. It's just old man Mountain showing us who's boss. Granny then pulls her parachute and floats softly through the clouds. It turns out it wasn't a vision Red saw earlier, it was the real Granny. She drops her golden piece of advice after seeing Red and saves her life, then drifts slowly through her chimney. She's finally home, but suddenly her parachute gets caught in the ceiling fan, quickly wrapping her up and shooting her into the closet, explaining why she was tied up this whole time. Twitchy gets thrown into the closet on cue, and the timelines collide for the fourth time. Another one? Back at the crime scene, Red is pissed that Granny was living a double life she never knew about, and then depressingly walks around the woods as she has her own version of Picasso's Blue Period, with flashbacks to her time spent with Granny in the past. But during all of the commotion, Red manages to sneak back into the house and steal the the recipe book from under everyone's Wake noses, up. sneaking back out of the house. Except it isn't red, it's Boingo. Wow, I never saw that coming. And if it wasn't already obvious, it's here that the others finally work it out. The only one who was with Red when she fell. Ah, no! Ah! Oh. Mm. Who knew a shortcut to Granny's? Oh yeah. Yeah, in fact, I know a shortcut. Who fraternizes with evil ski teams when the schnitzel truck was schnitzel truck. What the schnitzel? Not the bunny. I knew it. Never trust a bunny. Never trust a bunny. Grizzly and Nikki bolt into action, deploying their, um, men all over the woods. 
You'll get your boys down to Red's place. We'll need to head off that cable car. And bring in a police sketch artist. No? Make it a cartoonist. All right, we've got to hurry to beat it down the mountain. Bill, get everyone in the car. Okay. Tommy, you can bring that evidence with you. Let's go. All right, you heard the chief. Not Let's the move it. Come on. Keep it get a different car. The remaining three wander out of Granny's house to see that the schnitzel truck has been converted into a makeshift tank driven by Boingo's henchmen. The team from earlier in the snow competition, of course. <laughs> What have they done to my schnitzel truck? World of Tanks. Granny speculates that they're probably heading to an abandoned cable car station at the top of the mountain. There's an old cable car station at the top of the mountain. They recruit Twitchy to go down and quickly tell the cops that they're heading the wrong way. But how will Twitchy make it all the way down the mountain that fast? Well, caffeine, of course. I can't believe I'm saying this, but drink up. Mm? <laughs> Twitchy gets high off his nut and zooms down the mountain to go and redirect the cops, and the rest of the gang decide that they need to take matters into their own hands to stop Boingo. And I guess you could make the comparison of Wolf giving Twitchy caffeine to make him go mental to that scene in Over the Hedge, where Hammy's given an energy drink so that he can work his way through the hedge and get- <laughs> Meanwhile, up the mountain in the abandoned cable cart station, Red watches Boingo make some demonic faces <laughs> and then lunges at him. But frankly, he absolutely decimates her. The child abusing rabbit demands that Red is tied up, where he then proceeds to, of course, break into song about how he's the top of the woods. Oh yeah, I said I'm gonna be top of the woods. We also learn of Boingo's evil plan to steal all the recipes from around the woods and add an ingredient, Boingonium, making the snacks highly addictive. A little something I like to call Boingonium. You have created a new element. Then phase three of the plan is to blow the woods to smithereens and build a commercial empire with a zoo. Now I don't fully understand how a zoo would work with most of the people in the woods being animals, unless they just visit humans trapped in cages. But anyway, Boingo has his big finish and they toss Red into a cable car full to the brim with Dina Mite. You've been hoodwinked, baby! Hey, that's the title of the movie. And it turns out that Granny, Wolf, and the Axeman were watching the whole thing from a nearby rock. But before they even have time to put their plan into action, they get caught by Dolph and beat the living shit out of him. At the bottom of the mountain, it seems that Twitchy is still coked upon caffeine, so the police are having a hard time understanding what he's trying to tell them. It's the barn on fire! The barn's on fire! The well! Timmy's stuck in the well! Hold on. He seems to be speaking words of some kind. Boingo locks Red in the car and Wolf disguises the Axeman in Dolph's uniform so he can take his place in his biggest role yet. And it seems that his CSGO character model look in disguise works perfectly for Wolf to step in posing as a building inspector as Granny scales the side of the cave wall. Wait a minute. They do manage to take out Boingo's guards, but it's too late. Boingo lights the fuse and sends the cart hurtling down the mountain. <laughs> Granny is quick to chase after it though. She makes use of her extreme sports skills and grinds down the cable car wire on a baking tin. Finally, the police clock on. They notice the cart is making its way down the mountain and they need to act fast. Red manages to crawl out of a conveniently placed escape hatch in the car and crawls out onto the side of it. Granny swoops in, letting Red grab her hood, allowing it to swing up to her on top of the car. And just before the car is about to blow, Granny detaches it from the line. But they're not out of the woods yet though. <laughs> Out of the woods. Get it? Because they're... The movie's set in the... In the woods. This guy stinks! Boingo and his men are still hot on their heels, but this doesn't phase Granny. She tells Red to use her golden piece of advice from earlier, and the two of them shoot up to safety, sending Boingo and the gang right into the back of a police van, while they'll be locked away forever on terrorism charges. Not bad for a little cookie maker. Thanks. They all take news interviews and in a final clip we see Nikki recruit the gang into the Happily Ever After agency and they all live happily ever after. 
until they made a sequel to the movie that did absolutely terrible and bombed at the box office. But hey, overall, is Hoodwinked a forgotten masterpiece of a movie? Well, is it well animated? No, not really. That shit look like the battle pass. Does it have a lot of pretty cliche movie tropes? Yeah, sure. But for saying that they had so little to work with, it really didn't turn out too bad. The animation isn't unwatchable. In fact, at certain points of the movie, it had its moments. Sure, it didn't receive golden reviews from critics or audiences, but Hoodwinked found itself in this weird dynamic where despite negative reviews, it was still doing pretty good at the box office. And yeah, okay, the big reveal of Boingo being a villain might have been pretty obvious watching the film back now, but why are you judging Hoodwinked as an adult anyway, you big weirdo. I'm sure I can speak for millions when I say that I loved this movie as a kid, and I probably did fall hook, line and sinker for the reveal when I watched it for the first time. Hoodwink's plot is pleasantly unique for an animated movie and makes for a nice change to see four linear stories from different perspectives interlink as the plot goes on. Not to mention the tiny little details the filmmakers added in to set out how the events took place at similar times chronologically in the movie. Like for example, remember the schnitzel song from earlier on in the movie? <laughs> Well, Wolf actually tunes into that song when he's flicking through the frequencies on his radio with Twitchy in the woods. Now that addition wasn't necessary and it doesn't change the movie in any way, but it's a cool detail to show you that the two events were happening at the same time. The movie might be a blatant rip-off of Shrek with all the fairy tale references dotted throughout the movie, but they admit that. Sure, the movie's a little rough around the edges, but that only adds to the whole feel of it. The story is great, the jokes are actually funny, the brilliant voice acting makes up for what the animation didn't, and the songs are catchy as shit. What isn't there to like? I honestly think if Hoodwinked was slightly more popular, it could have been named alongside the big hitter animated movies of the time. It doesn't take itself too seriously either. It's not going for an Oscar. It's that weird light-hearted animated movie that a good handful of people probably watched as kids and enjoyed. To be honest, it's not horribly bad, but it's also not perfection. It's just good. Goodwinked. Overall, I think user CD Calendar summed it up pretty perfectly. Eight stars out of ten. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. Ha. Thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring the video, and with all of that said, goodbye!